Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's Hello program. Hello and welcome to the Australian Property Podcast. Today you have myself, Amy Lenardi and Chris Bates, and we are here to answer some of your questions. We absolutely love listener questions. And Owen said, make sure you ask for listener questions, but don't sound too desperate. So <laughs> this is me trying to not sound too desperate. <laughs> now, before answering these questions, as always, we have to have the disclaimer that this is not financial advice. So even if we answer your questions, we are not giving you specific financial advice. You should always seek out a financial planner or a mortgage broker before acting on any decisions. But we're here to answer your questions so that you can apply them to your own specific situation and then go and ask more questions elsewhere. Let's get into it. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. We love questions. I mean, it's it's by a financial planning background, it sort of allows us to think about the what ifs, you know, the scenario that if we did that, what would the impact on that? So yeah, definitely send your questions through. Maybe you um do the first question and we'll have a crack at it, Amy. The first question is from Gumtree, obviously not their real name. <laughs> I'm currently thinking of investing in a property, but going principal and interest and also doing it in a location that I might one day want to retire thereby blurring the lines of investment and lifestyle. I'm sorry, <laughs> they wrote that. But still following the theory of buy land because they're not making it anymore. What are your high-level thoughts? Oh, it's a good question. There's a bit to it here. So mm -hmm. um, there's potentially a loan structuring question here, um, the P&I versus going interest and only. That's a part of it. Um, yeah, definitely well, the blurring. Yeah, blurring the lines between investment and lifestyle. I'm sure we've both got a lot to say around that. Like, and um, yeah, and, and even just the saying buy land, they're not making any more of it. Well, they actually are in in some <laughs> yeah. places. So it depends on where you are and where you're buying. Um, and so, you know, because they're turning farms to houses, I guess. So that's making more land. So, I mean, let's just go on the first bit, first around the loan structure, because that's sort of what we do. Um I think buying a property and going P&I, I mean, there is the reason you might do that is because it's a slightly better interest rate than it going interest only. Um, but to, pay, to get that better interest rate, your in payments are going to be higher than if you go interest only. And my worry with this is, and this generally with investing um, investment properties, you generally want to go interest only because most people have got an owner-occupier debt. Um, you know, and that debt is deductible, non-deductible, and their investment property is deductible. So what that basically means is that you really want to be paying off your home debt and keeping up the debt on your investment properties while you still got one. Now, if this person has no home debt and they're super cashed up and they want to buy an investment property, they want to get the most optimal rate, um, then yeah, maybe go P&I. Or if this is someone trying to buy their first investment property um, that they're potentially going to sell to then upgrade their home, then you might go P&I because you're going to get that money. It doesn't really matter you're paying that off because you're going to sell anyway. But this person's not saying that, you know, Gumtree, um, it's a cool name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gumtree yep. is saying they may want to retire in this location. So really they're thinking this is a long-term hold. Um, so yeah. this doesn't line up with going principal and interest. So generally speaking, that would be my first worry. You know, should this person be going interest only um, and paying off their home? on principal and interest and really trying to pay that off as fast as they can. Um, mm. And let's go to the second part of the question, which is really about, you know, when people start to invest for their lifestyle plus also invest to get an investment return, what's your thoughts on that, Amy? Well, the way that I would look at this is in an ideal world, we do separate a home or future um, personal requirements, like if that's a holiday house or one you want to live in in the future. Ideally, we do separate that from an investment property strategy. And the reason is because in many cases, what you want in a home or where you want to live isn't necessarily going to be the exact right strategy if you were just purely looking at it from an investment perspective. Mm. So saying from an investment perspective, I have a certain budget and amount of cash flows this is what I need that property to achieve for me. Those two might not 
align and quite often they don't. However, however, first of all, I'm thinking this person, well, we don't know if they're 20 years old or 60 years old. Yeah. If they are much younger, then there's so much more uncertainty around the future and mm. what their life is going to look like in 40, 50, 60 years versus if they are getting a little bit closer to time and they've got that bit more certainty of where they think they might retire, then in which case you might sit back and look at your situation and say, okay, if I can somehow hit two birds with one stone, if I can do that with this strategy, why not consider it? Yeah. So <laughs> I would then look at the um, the metrics for your investment strategy. So how much can you spend? What are your cash flows? And then don't, don't think about where you want to retire for now, but think about all of the options that you could then invest in and then if that area you want to retire in does fit those metrics and is an area you probably could have or would have considered anyway, then, yeah, I do think you should have it on that list and explore that option. I think you've absolutely nailed it, Amy. I think there's some really good points in there. How far away you are from retirement is a really big one um, because you, preferences and what you like to do on weekends and what you like to do for fun changes each decade, each year potentially, and what you envisage to be what you want in 20 or 30 years' time probably won't be what you want today. You know, naturally, uh, you know, what we think we want is not what we're going to want in the future. And it's very risky. You go and say, well, I think in 30 years' time I want to move to this regional location and retire there. Well, what happens if that doesn't happen? And what happens if you ended up buying a property that didn't perform from an investment point of view because of some idealistic you know, view that you were going to do something in the future. And so I think getting closer to retirement, um, absolutely, I, you know, if, if clients were coming to us and they were in their 50s and, and they were saying, look, no, we really love that regional location. Um, we know even if our kids have grandkids, we can still get back to the city. So it might be, say, it's Melbourne, they might want to buy just outside Geelong or Mornington Peninsula or something like that. But they can, and they um, have, have visited that location heaps of times. Um, and they also are not buying for what they want as downsizers slash retirees, but they're also buying what that market really needs, that, that market's driven by. So you'd also want to buy a property that also suits families, for example. It's not just pigeonholed to people retiring down there. Um, and so I think you're right. I think that's you can do it potentially, but you need to make sure it is, you know, A, something that's likely to happen. And B, it's also um, a good investment because if it's not a great investment, then personally I would just wait and try to deal with that when you get to that stage. Invest your money elsewhere, build up your capital, and then if that does end up being what you end up wanting, then you've got assets to sell to actually go and buy it. Um, mm. You don't need to worry about it if it isn't a great investment. So I completely agree with you, Chris. And in terms of long-term potential too, yes, we want to appeal to the owner-occupier market of that area, but also in the meantime, you're going to have to lease that property out if it's an investment mm. property. So what's the rental market like? And if it's an area you want to retire in, perhaps it's down the coast or in a regional town or somewhere which doesn't have a strong rental demand. And, you know, I'm thinking, for example, here in Melbourne, retiring down on the Mornington Peninsula, which is really, really lovely. Um, but what's that rental market like? Is that more owner occupiers and then holiday homes? Who are you going to be leasing out to in the meantime? So always keeping that in mind as well. But also I'm looking at this um, if, if, if we are that in that little bit later stage in our life and we're going to buy an investment property separately and that property then needs to perform so that we can sell that and give ourselves flexibility to, sell, to buy where we want to retire, well, the closer you get to retirement too, and of course, I'm not a financial planner, I'm, I'm a buyer's advocate, so I'm thinking about this from a property perspective too. Yeah. Um, the closer you get to that retirement, the less time you have for that property to do what you need to do in terms of make um, have capital growth and then resell it. And then you've got to pay stamp duty again to get into that retirement place. Yeah. So, yeah, the closer you get to that point in time, the, the less flexibility you have in terms of options. So, you know, in that instance, that retirement option could be a good option. But coming back to the statement around buy land, they're not making it anymore. In theory, that's a good idea, but it's not always the case, is it, Chris? No, I think um, your two points there, I'll just double confirm them as well. The rental market, I think a lot of people with this holiday lifestyle, they think, I'll just throw it on Airbnb and I'll make this killing on Airbnb. And it's just not that simple because the reality is most of the time when you get the highest rental, it's probably the time where you want to use it, you know, the Correct. school holidays um, over the Christmas period. So unless you're really retired and you can use it during the week when you're not really going to get 
uh, many people wanting to rent it on Airbnb and you want to use it on weekends, well, that's going to be basically just paying to rent it off yourself um, and you're going to reduce your Airbnb income. And I think a lot of people we've seen go down the Airbnb route and if it's not a really unique place um, and it really looks amazing on the options in the in the place, then ultimately you get pushed to the bottom, you know, and, and people will go, well, why would I rent your place? Because something's nicer up the road. Um, mm. And you have to basically cut your Airbnb rent down to a point where it's not really that um, profitable for you so i think the airbnb there's a bit of a fallacy there where i'll buy an investment property that i'll retire in one day i'll make heaps of money on airbnb um and i don't have to worry about the local rental market i think your other point around close to retirement is a really big one as well you know that's why we find it really hard to advise sometimes people in their mid to 50s and even sometimes early 50s depending on their retirement plan because you know things like super things like their shares and, and speaking to a financial planner and getting a real good retirement plan um, can really you need to weigh it up versus property um, because time is sometimes not on your side and especially if you buy properties that are negatively geared going into retirement and, and things like that so that's a really good point yeah the idea around buying land they're not making anymore that's true if you're living in the inner city um, where there is no land left and if anything there were um, you know, knocking houses down to build townhouses and build apartments, et cetera. So there's becoming less land available for houses. But that's not true if you go to the outskirts of a capital city and where they're turning farms to housing estates. Or if you buy a townhouse, um, for example, they're making more townhouses. So they're creating more land for townhouses. And so you've got to be really careful with that sort of ideology because not all land is equal. So some land is really scarce and it's super desirable to um, and they're not making any more of it. And over time, more and more people want to live on that piece of land. And some pieces of land, um, they are making more of it or it's not that desirable. And so, yeah, you've got a lot of land, but it's not that desirable. So it's not going up in price. And so yeah, we want to focus on land scarcity and land value, yeah. not necessarily <laughs> just land itself or land size. You know, better to be on a, a smaller block in a really, really premium suburb versus a huge block in the outskirts. And that's where you see the per square meter rates change yeah. quite quite a lot because it's a ref, it's a reflection of the scarcity and the demand of that little pocket of land so that that's i think um a myth when it comes to property that you should just buy land 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 there is different quality of land you know it let's do the second one amy oh righty so this is this ties in quite well actually chris because it is a question from mr fancy pants and his question is, which financial advisors can actually give advice on property? They aren't trained or qualified or certified in property, but are in super and perhaps shares or funds. So you get throwaway lines like sell the properties and put it into super or funds, ignoring the huge taxation implications. I asked my super fund and none of their internal or external advisors would be able to help. Now, Chris, I come across this quite often when I'm speaking to clients because I'm there sort of at the very end when they have a strategy, have that, an idea in mind. And my job as a buyer's advocate is to then implement that strategy or sometimes highlight things that perhaps they might have not spoken about before. But, but financial planners there's a bit of a gap, right, when it comes to property advice and regulations around property advice in that there's basically no, no regulations and financial advisors aren't necessarily qualified to be giving this advice. So who do you turn to if you want this professional advice, Chris? This is a really big question. It's a big problem within the financial advice community that they have not wanted to really solve. And I'll give you a bit of background story. The financial advice industry, not to bore you, started a long time ago selling insurance and selling things called investment bonds. Um, and then they started selling you know, personal insurance and they started selling super funds and um, other investments, et cetera. Financial advice has come from a sales industry into actual trusted advice and their, their traditional fee models have been percentage of funds under management. And so they have. if they said to you, look, I know you want to buy an investment property, why are you doing that? You should put money into shares. And that conflict has been massive and it hasn't really ever been removed. And because, um, you know, there, there has, I mean, been removed with financial advice reform regulation where there's fee for service and no commissions. But a lot of the advisors still haven't got that training around property. So they haven't gone and built their knowledge. They haven't got the relationships there, et cetera, um, because they've seen themselves as investment managers, right? And there's also a lot of property bears within the financial advice space who, mm. you know, have believed the lie that property is going to one day crash and, um, you know, that they need to take their, save their clients from that and put it into their portfolio of shares, et 
etc um, without really going down a process of educating so i've been an advisor for 13 years i ended up selling our business in 2020 this is something that i could see was a huge issue now a lot of the new advisors coming through charge on something called a fixed fee and they'll charge you a fee for the advice and they'll charge you a fixed fee ongoing and they're being a little bit more i don't care how you invest the money whatever's going to be the best option for you my fee stays the same and so i think a lot of these advisors are moving to that direction but they haven't gone and built the relationships and knowledge around the property advice my my concern is if you go to a financial advisor the super funds wouldn't look at you to give you property advice they're very restricted in what they can look at um but if you, if you go to an advisor and they start talking to you about buying this type of property, um, this type of development, et cetera, and they start giving you property advice, which they can by having a real estate license, for me, run out the door. Um, mm, yeah. Financial advisors shouldn't be giving individual property advice. They're not trained for it. The, the people who should be giving individual property advice is buyer's agents and and picking the right buyer's agent based on your budget and the location that you're buying and, buy, and, and picking someone that's super experienced in that. The advisor should really just be the middleman in saying, identifying a need and going, I think you need to get some advice around your home, whether it's a good asset, um, what, what you could do with downsizing. Here's a great buyer's agent to help you think that through. Um, the, the, the proper, and the, the financial advisor can do modeling and help you with cash flows and help you think through. But actually, this property versus that property, I just don't think they're trained for it. And so um, I think it's a, it's, it's a teamwork approach. It's the right financial advisor then says okay this is the best buyer's agent that's the approach we take as a broken business we say okay well so if you're buying in melbourne then chat to amy right but if you're buying in say um the eastern suburbs of sydney or the northern beaches of sydney they'd be different people if you're buying in brisbane you know you can chat to pete etc so you need to get individual local advice um and I think that's the, the missing ingredient. So financial advisors aren't here to solve that problem. They're not trained on it. There's no education. Um, and the property market is unregulated, which we'll explain more in you know, other episodes. Yeah, this is this is the big gap, right? And when um, Mr. Fancy Pants is asking his question, he's basically identifying this huge gap in the the regulations here in Australia. So to be a financial advisor here in Australia, Chris, what are the current qual qualifications that you need? So this is a real frustrating thing in the advice community right now. It's something called phasia, and it's a uh, it's going through Parliament at the moment, and they're potentially going to wind back the regulation that they brought in recently. So it's all up in the air, but technically they're pushing to a place where you need a degree. Um, it could just be a grad cert or a master's. Um, new advisors need a professional year. They need to go through an annual exam. I think it is annual. Um, but what's happened to the financial advice industry? It's gone from, you know, circa 25, 30,000 advisors down to about 15,000. Um, not just because of these reforms, but because it's been going on for almost 10 to 15 years of um, uncertainty around regulation. But the standards absolutely is increasing. It's, it's not going the other way uh, yeah. where you don't need qualifications. And that's and to be a financial advisor, or for you as a consumer to receive financial advice, you would hope that that advisor is incredibly qualified because this is your financial future we're talking about. But when it comes to property, I'll give you an example. I could hire someone. I have my full license, but I could hire someone tomorrow who has done their agent's representative course, and they have in Victoria here. They have recently increased the qualification here so you need a cert for but in the past it was about a one week course so let's say I hire someone a few years ago they did that one week course they can go and call themselves a property advisor or an investment advisor there is nothing stopping them from doing that they could have no experience in any of this and it's quite horrifying and I'm looking forward to the day in the future where government sits down and recognizes this huge risk and this huge risk where not only does it expose people to receiving poor advice from unqualified people who have no experience, no life experience, they could have almost no property experience, but also these spruikers who are out there, people who are selling off the plan, house and land, getting a commission, not necessarily disclosing that to you, not tailoring that strategy to your personal situation and just trying to sell your product. And that is so common when it comes to property. So you're absolutely right, Chris, in that finding a financial advisor to begin with needs to be someone who is going to listen to you and what you want. And if, if you see property or you want property to be included in your financial plan in the future, you have to find an advisor who is open to that. They don't need to be an expert, but they need to not be against it. 
because otherwise they're not going to make it work for you. If you find an advisor then who is open to factoring that in, then you need to figure out a strategy of how that fits in. What's that going to look like? How are you going to allocate your assets in the future? And then find a specialist or find an expert, a buyer's agent who is ideally got experience in investing, who might have their QPIA, which is what I have, Qualified Property Investment Advisor. It's not um, a government mandated thing. It's just an extra thing that you could could search for. And then creating, adding that property expert into your team as well. That's the best thing at the moment. That's the best way forward in terms of answering this question. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a real, um, you, you've got to be, I guess, careful, I guess, when you're going down any advice professional, whether it's a buyer's agent, a financial advisor, a mortgage broker, et cetera. Um, and you've really got to know the system before you go in. Otherwise, you're going to get sold, unfortunately, sometimes a system that doesn't align with the outcomes that you need. You know, unfortunately, it's a big problem in the advice industry. But also, I um, mean, the broking industry is a challenge as well. There's a lot of brokers out there that unfortunately um, have been sold the dream that, you know, the best strategy with properties, X, Y, Z, because they've been introduced to some spruker that's promising these amazing returns and amazing cash uh, capital growth. And, you know, you could help all your clients buy all these properties and they just haven't gone and built the networks. They don't actually know what they don't know. And um, that's, a, that's a big problem in, in the broking industry as well. So the third question comes from Hello Kitty. <laughs> and they have asked, when buying a freestanding house, what type of reports or external analysis can you rely on to ensure there are no construction defects or major structural issues with the building? Now, this is quite topical for me because Mm. I have just recently, just this week, had a property that my clients were interested in. We got a building inspection and it failed miserably. Mm. So huge, huge issues with that property. And it's quite devastating when you fall in love with a property and you, you see, you picture yourself moving in and you get your building inspection done and problems come back. But this is the, this is your first point of call. So finding a good, reputable building inspector, and this could be through um, Google reviews, through finding, like asking friends or family or people who have bought before. Um, I'm going to say the agent to a certain extent, but, and some agents have great contacts, but I have had situations before where I've heard of people use the agent's recommendation and the agent is using them because they are less discerning or more favorable, um, less, less picky. And I, um, I heard a story, you know, quite recently of someone who purchased over in Perth and they bought the property and that building inspection did not pick up half of the issues with that property. And then they found out that that person had a relationship with that agent. So, um, just, just to be mindful there. So using. Absolutely. While we're there, Amy, um, that absolutely with the agents' reports, I would never really rely on them myself. Um, we've seen it multiple times and, you know, coincidentally, we actually saw it last week. We had a client buy south of Sydney. Um, this is a, a large, expensive property, you know, well over $2, 3000000 million. Um, they had the building in pest. They bought it with a, a cooling off because um, that was the way that negotiation you can do in, you know, New South Wales where you have five days cooling off. And in there they were doing their own building in pest. And the agent's report versus what they got their own building inspector, they missed all these waterproofing issues in two bathrooms and they also missed that the roof wasn't roof wasn't done correctly. Um, and now they're in a negotiation where they're extending cooling off and they're trying to figure out um, what to do. So if they went ahead with just the agent's building and pests, you know, we're talking a multi-million dollar property here, they'd be up for maybe about 150 grand of repairs to two bathrooms right now that they wouldn't have known of. So I'd personally always spend the four to six hundred dollars that that might cost to do that properly. Yeah, that's definitely step number one. So finding um, a good building inspector, and I know it can sometimes be hard if you don't have any contacts. Mm. That's step number one. Now, the building inspector's job is primarily um, to identify defects, and these are usually categorized into two categories, which is um, minor defects and then major defects. And there are definitions around how they have to classify things as major defects, but quite often this is uh, to do with the structural structural elements of the property. So a building inspector will look at things um, like the foundations, they will look at any moisture issues which could be contributing to structural issues, they'll have a look at the roof, they'll have a look at any bowing or unlevel flooring. They'll essentially be looking at a combination of things to then put together a puzzle because sometimes 
things aren't clear. Some things aren't visually clear, but there can be suspicions of issues which you can then look into further and it's their job to identify these things. So what would happen or what do you do if a building inspector does identify structural issues? Well, it depends on the severity. So for example, it might be as straightforward as the building inspector saying to you, and this is why I always like to have building inspectors that are happy to have a chat and happy to have a conversation because they might have to classify something as structural, but it's actually not that big of a deal. So you speak to them and they might say, I have to identify it as that, but it's a cheap fix or it's an easy fix or it's something to, you need to be aware of in the future. Or they might say, you need to go and get another specialist involved, go get a quote on underpinning or in the case of the property I was looking at this week, we got a structural engineer out to check. I was able to get one through within two days. They cost about $800 for this particular person, and they were able to give us an incredibly comprehensive report, which unfortunately for us confirmed my suspicions in that this property was not going to be purchased by us. Um, but that could be the next step too, just to add that extra layer on, okay, okay, some major structural defects were identified. Who else am I going to get out to check these things to see if those are deal breakers or things that I'm willing to take on? Because every buyer will have different tolerance in terms of how much risk and cost they're willing to take on for that property. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that the, the, it's really hard when you're searching, going to open homes. Um, I think this happened, Amy, when we were buying, you know, uh, with yourself back, a, I don't know, seven, eight years ago uh, and we were in love with a property and the report came back and it was, you know, chalk on the walls, mm. the <laughs> issues in the roof, the bricks were, we didn't see the brick issues and the substance, like the, and there was lots of issues that, and I think it's a really hard time because you're sort of so in love, but I think you just got to be thankful that the reports picked it up. And I think the mm. key thing is with the report is, get in contact with the person who's written the report and have a conversation with them and ask them questions, you know, based on what you've seen in the area, you know, how does this really stack up? Would you buy the property? Would you buy it for your family? You know, like. Uh, oh, I'm going to disagree with you that, on that one, Chris, but we, we can do this openly because we're allowed to disagree with things, right? On yeah, yeah, go podcast. for it, yeah. yeah. So I, I don't think, I would never, as a buyer, ask a building inspector, would you buy this property? Because they're not you. They're not you. Yeah. What, they, what, yeah. You will have different um you'll have different goals and values in that property. They don't know how much work you're willing to take on. They don't know your risk aversion. They don't know how much extra cash you've got. Um, so I would always say, and you'll but you'll you'll get a feeling from when they're talking to you on how worried they are about things. And you need to ask as many questions until you get to the point where you're either comfortable or not, or you need to get more specialists or not. But yeah, I think that um I, and this is just me, like buying over the last 10 years. If I ever have building inspectors that start to give their personal ins opinions too much because they do not know the client, mm. then that's a little bit concerning for me. And I sort of say to them, hey, that's, you know, not necessarily your your job. Just Yeah, that's absolutely. My yeah. <laughs> when I was saying, would you buy this, would you buy it from a building quality point of view? Would you, not from an investment point of view, et cetera. It was more a case of, you know, do, is, do you think this is something you should walk away from? I mean, are we, um, that's something I, I think it, I think it's sometimes valuable if you ask it in the right way, but it's not obviously mm. the key question. You really want them to really dig deep and, mm. and also ask them where didn't they check, you know, because there's lots of places they couldn't get to in yes. terms of under the floor, in the roof and and, and if they are big areas, they can't get to because sometimes it's, you know, to crawl through a tiny little hole or et cetera. Um, in this scenario with this client, they had to get and see this waterproof issue, they had to use a little camera. Um, mm. Now, the building inspector said, oh, on the real estate report, we can't get to that area, so we can't check it. Well, the other building inspector had the camera and they could see that there was massive issues with the, the waterproofing. Um, and That's so, an incredibly yeah. important point in that building inspectors will always have limitations. And that is because there's two types of main limitations. The first one is the fact that they can't cut the floor open. <laughs> they yeah. can't cut the walls open. Sometimes they can't climb into the roof because there's no access. Um, so they, they are doing what's called a visual inspection. They're actually not allowed to move furniture too or move things. And there's often when a property is occupied, there's things in the way. So there's... Um, there's, there's, there's restrictions on access in terms of not being able to get behind walls and then just not being able to see things because of obstructions. 
So when you're having a chat with the building inspector, understanding how much they could actually see, what they couldn't see, um, in many cases they can't actually see into the subfloor because there's no access around the perimeter of that property and in which case they have to use other tools and methods to be able to highlight any risks, their moisture meters, any walls that are out, uh, the flooring that's out, any moisture around the property to be able to then give you an idea. But buying a property is never without risk in any instance, especially when it comes to building inspections, knowing that there is only so much a building inspector can do. And I think the key lesson here is if you are a first-time buyer and you are looking to purchase a property, like expecting to get a property that's absolutely perfect on a building inspection, it's probably not likely, right? If there's always going to be issues, but it's can you afford to take on those risks that or those – and if they are big potential expenses and you're putting all your money in for a deposit and you're borrowing 90%, for example, and then bang, you need 20 grand to fix a roof or something, that could wipe you out. So you just got to be really careful, especially when tight, cash is really tight, taking on properties that might need a lot of work. And so it's even more important that you really get this due diligence. So thanks to Hello Kitty and Mr. Fancy Pants and who is the first one, Gumtree. Thanks very much for sending in your listener questions. We really appreciate it and we'd love to hear from you. You can get in touch with us through the links in the show notes. Chris, how can everyone get in touch with you if anyone wants to um, get a mortgage broker? Absolutely. We'd love to help. You can find us at blusk, B-L-U-S-K dot com dot au. And you can find Amy's course at the property guidebook dot com dot au. It's an awesome course for you to check out. Good to chat, Chris. See you next time. Thanks, Amy.